controversial Million Youth March, its organizer, Khalid Mohammed, sat down for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with our Dominic Carter. Dominic joins us now with a few excerpts from the interview. Dominic? Good evening, Lewis. He's been called a demagogue and a racist. And with every press conference, Khalid Mohammed adds fuel to those charges. We know very little about the man at the center of the storm of tomorrow's Million Youth March. At times confrontational, at times lashing out at me, Mohammed defended his rhetoric and his mission. As for tomorrow, Mohammed says he hopes for a peaceful, orderly rally, but he will not rule out violence. Believe in peace if possible but violence when necessary. So you're telling me here now that you're not ruling out the possibility of violence tomorrow? I honestly do not believe, uh, Brother Dominique, as hard as you attempt in your weak manner to press, I honestly do not believe that there will be any violence tomorrow whatsoever. Muhammad already appears to be in damage control mode about tomorrow's event. We asked him if the march will be a failure if only 2,000 people turn out. Muhammad's answer, no, because thanks to the media, millions have already heard his message. Muhammad has also been dogged by questions about where his funding comes from, a topic he was not too happy to discuss. How do you make your living? Where, where do you earn your money from? How do you make your living? Where I mean, do you I get your money from? But again, I'm here in the room. Well, how much do they the pay you? Um, I, I make a decent salary. Where and I make a decent make? salary wow. from the masses of black people who love me. From donations? From the masses of black people who love me and love the strong and bold, uncompromising stand to reestablish black power. Muhammad did tell us he did not pay for his Harlem brownstone or even the suit he wore to the interview. We asked him what, besides the color of his skin, separates him from David Duke. Muhammad says his people have been oppressed, Dukes have not. We also asked him this question about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What would Dr. King think of what you're doing? What, what would, if he were alive today, what, the, the, the hateful words that you have used to describe people, what would he think? As we say in the black community, you're too much. I mean, they've given you a list of questions. You're just making sure you go through every one of them. I hope they will give you a bonus, Mr. Carter. <laughs> what would Dr. King think? You sit here and ask me what Dr. King would think. How could I possibly know what Dr. King would think? I think, though, that maybe Dr. King would understand that when you have a strong, militant, revolutionary, uncompromising voice out there, that it forces the enemy in a position to say, I'd better deal with Martin Luther King Jr. I certainly don't want to deal with the black power crew that's out there. Critics have charged Muhammad became invisible after last year's march. We asked him what has he been doing the last year. His answer, working street patrols with an organization known as Black Men's Movement Against Crack, he says he's working to set up a free food program and also doing work, Lewis, with political prisoners. Right, thanks a lot, Dominic. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Inside City Hall. I'm Andrew Kurtzman. The mayor says he's a hate monger. Harlem politicians say he's an outsider. He's called a demagogue, a racist, an anti-Semite. And with every press conference, Khalid Mohammed adds fuel to those charges. Tomorrow, he'll address his so-called Million Youth March. Today, the minister sat down for an exclusive interview with my New York One colleague, Dominic Carter. Tonight, we'll bring you that interview. And then later, we'll bring together our Friday Reporters Roundtable to discuss the matter. We'll also part the curtains on this week's winners and losers in the news. But we begin with our top story. Khalid Mohammed refused today to rule out the possibility of violence at tomorrow's rally. He met up with our camera crew at Amy Ruth's, a restaurant on 116th Street in Harlem. He sat down with Dominic Carter to discuss his critics, his reputation, and more. Here is that interview. Mr. Khalid Mohammed, we want to thank you very much for joining uh, us here on New York One. Thank you, Brother Dominic. I hope this is an opportunity for you to express your views, but also Frankly, there are some very serious questions that, that you need to answer. So let me go back to last year's Million Youth March, right. the first one that was held here. Now, you claim to be a leader in the African-American community, but what kind of leader tells 
thousands attending a rally. And self-defense, if they touch you, take their guns. In other words, what type of real leader advocates violence when there are thousands of young lives at risk? The Bible speaks of the Good Shepherd. And the Bible says that when the wolves attack the sheep, attack the flock, that the Good Shepherd is a responsible shepherd, and that shepherd works indeed to protect the flock from the attacking wolves. I notice you said in your statement that it was a statement in self-defense, and certainly in the Second Circuit Court and the Court of Appeals, Judge Chin and the higher court determined that my words were indeed words spoken in self-defense and self-defense only. But what kind of leader uses those words when there are people's lives at risk? A strong and, and leader, then, a bold leader, leader an then, uncompromising and, and leader. And then the type of leader that as soon as, as, soon as the, the stuff hits the fan, he leaves. Well, you know that I didn't leave, but you are playing the devil's advocate as you do so often. You're sitting here in the place of the white man saying what the white man wants you to say. Minister, You've seen in the newspapers, in the Post, Minister, in the Daily News, Minister, me in the middle of the police Minister, and the security holding me back. It was impossible to leave. I've even heard the lie that I left in a white Mercedes being, a uh, white Mercedes Benz, which was early in the morning at 9 a.m. when I went to Federal Express. The police froze all vehicles behind the stage. No vehicle was allowed to leave that day. And as I faced the Klan the and police in Jasper, Texas, after they had dragged our brother to his death, that is the way I faced them that day. And it is a propaganda scheme to say that I turned heels and ran, and I understand it's up to you to make sure that that gets out. But let, let, let me backtrack for one second. It, you know, you, you've started with, I'm here in the white man's shoes, and I guess you're headed with the Uncle Tom. Do you work for New York uh, One? I, I do work for Are you York being paid for this interview? But, but Do that, you get a check, sir? Shot? Is that the best shot that you have, the, the Uncle Tom line? I didn't call you Uncle Tom, right. but... You, you said I'm You've said it answers. better than it could be said. You are here indeed. I believe you are a professional. But I do also believe that as a professional, you have a job. You have a duty. And I don't believe that you are a reporter first in the way that you have presented yourself to the community, a reporter who reports fairly. I believe that before being a reporter, you shouldn't be a reporter first. You are not a reporter first. You should be black first with the responsibility. What kind of reporter would sit up and keep telling lies? What kind of reporter would try to confuse his people for a paycheck? Well, can you answer that, sir? Again, I'm here to ask the question. But can you answer that? Again, one other Will question. Will you answer that, sir? Minister, I'm not here to answer the what question. What kind I'm, of reporter would ask the question? Put out false reports, sir. I, I, I don't know. Brother, brother. I love you, but don't do this, brother. Be a strong reporter. Be a revolutionary reporter. It was Paul Robeson who said the battlefield is everywhere. And so you must battle on the battlefield at New York One. Police made the move last year to shut down the generator. But you had to know, you had to know, you're a very smart man, that the city was not going to let you go one minute past four o'clock. Can one reasonably conclude that you were looking to spark an incident, possibly to spark a riot? Emphatically, no, sir. I was not. And I appreciate the credit that you have given me. But I did indeed believe that there would be flexibility at the end of the rally because they had promised flexibility. And they had said that there would not be strict adherence to the four o'clock. So as you know, and I've heard you say, I had finished speaking. The police attacked an otherwise peaceful rally that had already concluded as I told our people to go on home in love and unity to their families. So I guess to some degree, sir, I did not believe that they would attack at 4 o'clock or 4.01 in answer to your question. Are you going to honor the 4 p.m. deadline tomorrow? Indeed, I will honor the 4 p.m. deadline on tomorrow. Are you willing to vow that you or your supporters will not call for violence tomorrow under any circumstance? No, sir, I am not. We believe that by the grace and the power of Almighty God and our ancestors that we have a God-given right. We have a human right, 
And according to white constitutional law, we also have, according to white constitution, a constitutional right to believe in peace if possible, but violence when necessary. Everything in nature, sir, will defend itself. We should not be the aggressor. We should not be provocative, but we should defend our men, our women, our children, and our elders, as Judge Chin said, in self-defense. So you're telling me here now that you're not ruling out the possibility of violence tomorrow? I honestly do not believe, uh, Brother Dominique, as hard as you attempt in your weak manner to press, I honestly do not believe that there will be any violence tomorrow whatsoever. As we present the Million Youth March 1999 seven point program of action, as we present that program to the masses of our people, to the indigenous people called the Latinos and called the Dominicans and the Cubans and the Puerto Ricans and the Red Indians or other indigenous people who will come to join in with us. And I hope you will be there. I will be there. Not just as a reporter, but as a black brother. I, I will be there in the role solely of a journalist. I want to talk. But black also, that. right? I want to talk. But you will be that. there as a black man, I, won't you? I will be there in the role of a journalist. Only as a journalist? But I'm interested. Oh, in brother Dominique, point. I'm embarrassed. I, I, I'm, I'm ashamed of you. You are somewhat a mystery. Uh, I believe you own a brownstone on Strivers Road here in Harlem. You don't believe that. You know that. Okay. Well, well, in Harlem. Where else do you live? Do you have a residence in New Jersey? No, sir, I do not. Only, only in You Harlem. know that if I had a residence in New Jersey, it would be back on the front page of the New York Post or Daily News as they put a, right after my assassination attempt, put the picture of the building I was living in and a map in case someone got lost on their way to my door. Okay, well that raises a very legitimate point. How can you claim to attack whites and you were living in New Jersey in a building predominantly? Sir, I live in New York and it's white. I live in the state of New York and it's white. That's not hypocritical. Indeed, I live in the United States of America and it's white control and white dominated. And I'm now interviewing on New York One, which is as white as it can be with a few black spots here and there. <laughs> Again, you, for the most part, <clears throat> remain a mystery. But can, can you tell us, since the last Million Youth March, what have you done here in New York as a leader? Not, not uh, general themes, specifics. I'm so happy to answer that question because my critics have called me an outsider. The politicians of Harlem, when every day they sanction busloads of whites who are outsiders to come in and gobble up Harlem like little white pack men and have sold out to the white business interests and run the vendors from 125th Street. I must say to you that we have been working throughout the entire year with the black men's movement against crack, going door to door and street by street and block by block in the black community. That's not what I just started doing, my dear brother. That is what I've been doing all of my adult life and some of my young uh, life as a teen. In addition to our anti-drug program, Such we're working to set up, we're working to set up the free food program, only giving out food now and having free food programs here and there, but intending to lay the base from this mass mobilization, as Brother Kwame Ture taught us before he went on to the ancestors, now mass organization, free food pro program, feed the multitudes over the past year. We have done street patrols called been crime feeding, units. Been feeding the poor over the past yes, year indeed, here in New York City. Sir, my dear brother, sir, we have been doing that. That, that brings up another... Very and working very with very political important. prisoners, political prisoners that most talk about or read about, we have direct contact with them, speaking to them by telephone and in person as we go in and out visiting them and fighting for those who are on death row unjustly. Brother Gary Graham, Brother Mumia Abu-Jamal, and many others of the political prisoners who are locked down. I'm not such a mystery. Black people in the black community have known me for a long time what, what and in the hip-hop community. But in a sense, the white man and you, to some degree, I don't believe you're really with them to that degree, or like Columbus, you are just discovering me just a few days ago. Well, that, that brings up another good point. 
How do you make your living? Where, where do you earn your money from? How do you make your living? Where I mean, do you I get your money from? But again, I'm here in the room. Well, how much do they the pay you? Um, I, I make a decent salary. Where and I make a make decent make salary now? from the masses of black people who love me. From donations? From the masses of black people who love me and love the strong and bold, uncompromising stand to reestablish black power, black nationalism, pan-Africanism, and black liberation theology in our youth and indeed in the masses of black people. So they make sure, my brother, that I have shoes on my feet well, and that I have food to eat. You flashed out at some of my colleagues in the press, but if you've done any research about me, you would know that I don't back down easily. So let me try it again. That's why I want you to be a comrade in the well, struggle, well, because well, you're well, not a well, back well, down well, man. Well, we need you, well, brother. Let's answer the, question. the black nation where, needs where, you. Where do you earn your living from? Specifically. Specifically from the masses of the people, as from the donations? pastor of the church, as the clergy of the church. As the clergy of the church, I have been wanting to be a minister since I was yay high. Of what church? And I am still the Church of Black Liberation Theology. And so are you paid a salary? I'm paid not only a salary, an expense account, so that I can travel. So many people, as we do with ministers in every denomination, the suit that is on my back now was given to me. Some businesses in the black community throughout America help support us. Brother, we have so much love and so much support. I almost said you would be surprised, but some of this you already know, but I understand you have to do it like that. Maybe I should try again. Try. Will you please give us an answer to specifically how do you raise your money? That's something they told you to press me on over and over again. I have simply said to you, it is very clear I have given an emphatically clear answer. As a minister in the black revolution and the black liberation struggle for our people, and a spiritual and cultural teacher among my people, I specifically, this is not a roundabout answer, sir. Well, is it donation? If someone gives you a suit, sir, that's a gift. It's a donation. If they give you clothes, even the house I live in, was paid for by someone else, as God is my witness. Was it paid for by the Nation of Islam? No, sir, it was not. But the Nation of Islam has indeed been my foundation. And what I have learned from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan is what gives me my base today and gives me my grace today by God's permission. Minister Muhammad, how does all the anti-Semitic talk lift up black people? I don't understand, sir, what you mean by anti-Semitic you know, you talk. Know exactly I don't what know I mean. what you mean. When, when, when I say anti-Semitic talk, and I, I don't want to repeat the comments that you've made in some of then the Then you don't want to ask about, me the question. About the cracker comments, the comments constantly about Jews keeping blacks down. Let's look at that, sir, if you will. When I say, Brother Dominique, the cracker... Cracker is a term of white origin. It is not a black term. And it is a term that has both a literal meaning and a figurative meaning. It means the cracker who cracks the whips, the whip or the whips with the old cat o nine tails from chattel slavery. But it also indeed means one who cracks a whip today. Giuliani, Safer, who cracks a whip to keep his slaves or to keep his subjects or people he would like to be his slaves or subjects and would like to keep under his control to crack that whip and keep them in line to tell black elected public officials i'm not going to meet you when jalo was shot at 41 times our brother abner louima was sodomized i'm not going to meet with you but to immediately set up negotiations with the community the so-called jews in uh, the Brooklyn area when something happens in their community. That's a cracker. We always said on the plantation, Lord, Lord, child, Lord, have mercy. Here come the cracker man. He's the one who cracks the whip to keep you in line. Okay, well, what is, besides the... And the so-called Jews, I say so-called, not in mockery, Brother Dominic. I'm not playing to any cameras. 
They are the so-called Jews because we are the true Jews, the true Hebrews, the true and real Israelites whose birthright have been, has been stolen by them. We are the true ones that fulfill Bible prophecy and scripture. Isn't it a fact that you know by throwing out those terms you're guaranteed press coverage? I'm not throwing out terms. I'm fighting age-old enemies and I'm planting seeds in the minds and hearts of the youth and the masses of my people that we will not make the same mistakes again. And as they say in the so-called Jewish community, never again, never again. What, what happened in your life that gave you your personal experience, your, your perspective on Jews in your lifetime? Study, experience, living, studying the teachings of Dr. Yosef ben Yakinen, the studying, studying the teachings of Dr. Uh, John Henry Clark, Studying the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Minister Malcolm X, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and Dr. Barashango, and Browder, and Akbar, and many others. There are volumes of material, and even studying the book called The Secret Relationship, Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, a book that thick with nothing but Jew, so-called Jew historians and scholars who explain their role in the black or the African Holocaust. Do you have a Jewish friend? No, sir, I do not have a Jewish friend. I am the black Jew. I am the black Hebrew. I am a member of the family of the black Hebrew Israelites. But if you're asking me, do I have a white so-called Jew friend who is not in that line of Semites, so I can't be anti-Semitic. Did you know that there are Semites in Africa? Did you know that there are Semites in Asia? That there are some Semites so black until they're blue, black, purple, black, and beautiful? These are people using a political term, anti-Semitism when it's really anti-Kemitism and anti-black program. Let me ask you this, um, and maybe you'll answer it and, and not attack me, but l let me try I this. haven't attacked you, brother. The Uncle Tom, Tom. I didn't call you an Uncle Tom. You, you haven't used it yet. But, but well, you, why you, accuse me of something I haven't done? Okay. You're just like they are well, in that instance, but you're not like that in other ways. Well, here, here's the question. Besides the fact that you're an African-American. What is the difference between you and David Duke? The difference? Oh, that's a good question. No one has enslaved David Duke's people for over 400 years. David Duke's people, the white people, have not been in slavery under us, chattel slavery. David Duke's people, the white people, have not been robbed of their names, their language, their religion, their culture, their God, their folkways, their mores, their norms, and indeed robbed of the very power of their own being. So David Duke's people are in power. My people have experienced an African holocaust, genocide, and we are being set upon and seized upon on a daily and consistent basis. One of the seven points is reparations, seven points of action to go after reparations for black people, fighting police brutality and harassment and the murder of our people. We'll David Duke's people don't experience we'll, we'll that. There that. is no comparison. But critics will say he spreads hate and so do you. Sir, I can't be responsible for what the critics say. I can only be responsible for the actual facts. Well, let me talk about Mayor Giuliani for one second. You describe him as a cracker. You did last year, you, you, do, it. you do it this year. But frankly, and you're, you say you're a leader in the black community. I didn't say hasn't, that, sir. You said I'm a leader in the black community. Hasn't Rudy Why Giuliani, are you giving me words here today? Hasn't Rudy Giuliani... Did I say a I'm a leader in the black community, sir? you have. Did I say I'm a leader in the black community, sir? You claim to be. I have never said that, Minister, sir. But can, can you answer my question? But I don't want you to base your question okay. on a false premise as you do when I'm not present. Well, well, I'm when, here when today. You, when you hold a million youth march and you say you're going to have 50,000 people as you did last year. And we did have 50,000 people. You know we didn't have 6,000 people. 
and you follow what the city says? You parrot what Giuliani and Safer say? I don't parrot what anyone says. Well, where did I, you I, get I the 6,000 figures? I look, I, I make my own observations. But you just told me the city said it. And now you say you got it from your own observation. Report, now, which one is actually says. true, Mr. Dominique Carter? What's actually true is I make my own observations from looking uh, from up and, and you down. saw only 6,000 people, say, sir? I didn't say what I saw. How but many did you but, see, but see, sir? But see, this is very interesting because you're Brother, not we love you. Don't do that. Let's hurry and get to your question. My question is, you uh, criticize Mr. Giuliani, but isn't the fact of the matter, Mr. Giuliani has done much more for Harlem than you ever have? I would have to say that that's not only incorrect from my perspective, but there are many, many, many black people. You perhaps from your seat and however big your, or little your check is may not be able to say it, but there are many black people who would have to disagree with you, sir. Well, from, from building up 125th Street. He tore down 125th Street. He's brought in white merchants, white commercial interests but who are biting up Harlem. Jobs? Isn't the object, Excuse believe, isn't me, the object sir. to have jobs? For but if Americans? you are like Giuliani and your uh, political platform is based on from welfare to work, and looks like is from welfare to farewell to black people, then you would work hard to make sure that black people can set up their own businesses since you are supposed to be, according to this white politics, the mayor of all of the people. Don't bring in outsiders as the, the uh, Negro politicians are saying in Harlem, the outsiders talking about us. When I live in Harlem, Attorney Wareham lives in Harlem, uh, scores of our organizers live in Harlem. These are outsiders coming in. If Giuliani meant well, he wouldn't have moved the vendors from 125th Street. This was the African marketplace of the world. People from all over Africa and Europe and the Caribbean looked forward, forward in the Caribbean to coming to 125th Street. Make a way, if you're serious, that black people can set up department stores, shoe stores. Black people can set up their own businesses and build up the community where they are. That's the platform we stand on what? with the Million Youth March Program of Action. What? But it is not Mr. Giuliani's platform. My question was, hasn't he done a whole lot more for Harlem than you have? And I've already answered you. But Somehow you keep you missing me. What have you done for Harlem? At this very moment that we sit here, I'm bringing black power, black nationalism, pan-Africanism, black liberation theology, setting the stage and creating the atmosphere for gaining a greater knowledge of ourselves and history and our heritage okay. so that we based on the program of Garvey and Elijah and Malcolm and Farrakhan and Carlos Cook and others, that we can begin to do something for ourselves instead of always waiting and depending on a handout from the slave master. So based on what you just said, if you have only a thousand people, maybe two thousand out there tomorrow, will your event be a failure? It will not be a failure because millions have heard our message. Right. You've made sure of that, Mr. Carter. What is your opinion of Dr. Martin Luther King? I believe that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a good man. I believe that his heart was good. I believe that he loved our people with all of his being and he wanted to see us breathe free. I believe that he tactically made one mistake and that was that he attempted to judge the white man by his own good heart. And what does that say about Dr. King? That says that Dr. King was one of the greatest that ever came among us. But like all of us, he was not perfect. What would Dr. King think of what you're doing? What, what would, if he were alive today, what, the, the, the hateful words that you have used to describe people, what would he think? As we say in the black community, you're too much. I mean, they've given you a list of questions. You're just making sure you go through every one of them. I hope they will give you a bonus, Mr. Carter. <laughs> what would Dr. King think? You sit here and ask me what Dr. King would think. How could I possibly know what Dr. King would think? I think, though, that maybe Dr. King would understand 
that when you have a strong militant revolutionary uncompromising voice out there that it forces the enemy in a position to say I'd better deal with Martin Luther King Jr. I certainly don't want to deal with the black power crew that's out there. How do you go? And it, it's amazing. Is this is this something that you do with blacks that disagree with you? You have to be a tom or a, a boot licking, buck dancing uh, person. Well, where, where, where does this come from? I mean, do, you you've made this charge several times to me during this interview. You know absolutely nothing I about. I call you boot licking. No, no, you tom? haven't. But but you you said I hope they give. Am I disappointing you, Mr. Carter? And since I'm not saying those things, you're just going to give them to me. Is that what's happening? No, 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 no. They're going to be angry with you when you come back because you couldn't get this across. So you're going to give these things to me. I haven't called you that, brother. You just said not that, one you said, time. You said they sent you with a list of questions, and I hope they give you a bonus when you get back to the station. Well, does your wife hope that they'll give you a bonus? You, you don't know anything about me. Brother, I know that you have a family, and a bonus could help. It's time for break. Welcome back to Inside City Hall. We now bring you the conclusion of Dominic Carter's interview with Khalid Muhammad, the man behind the Million Youth March. Minister, um, we've talked about many topics. Let, yes. Let's now let's now discuss your seven point plan. And, and and is it realistic? I mean, one of the things that you're talking about is. Uh, paying African Americans for slavery. Yes, sir. Now, the President of the United States, how many presidents did it take to apologize for slavery? You have to know that that's not realistic. Reparations, well, that it won't happen. Well, sir, the Japanese were paid, were paid reparations. The people who are called Jews were paid reparations. Uh, some of our brothers and sisters of the indigenous people who are called by the white man Indians, some of our brothers and sisters were paid reparations. And we can never say that it is unrealistic. It is a goal. It is a platform. It is a just demand against our oppressors and those who indeed owe us to repair the damage. So because you feel that it is unrealistic is not reason enough that the youth would take it from the seven point program of action. Can you go through the seven points quickly? Please allow me to do that. I thank you. Number one, the program of action for the Million Youth March 1999 is to end police murder and brutality and the harassment of our people. Point number two, self-defense of the black community, to build the people's militia as a self-defense unit as the Constitution of white America allows for. Number three, control of the politics and economics in our communities, build independent political, social, and financial institutions in our community. All realistic goals. Number four, build independent schools, black liberation schools, uh, community control schools, alternative schools, where we can train and teach our children a proper knowledge of self and education that will lead to a brighter future. One of our sub themes of the march is saving our youth, securing our future. Black power into the year 2000 is the main one. Uh, number five, reparations for the descendants of African people enslaved in the United States of America, we have just touched. Number six, free all political prisoners and prisoners of war. And number seven, self-determination for the black nation. Forty million Africans inside the United States are an oppressed and colonized nation, and our struggle, the youth say, and we back them up 100 percent, and it is our struggle also, is for national liberation. What type of leader identifies an elected official, a council member, yes, sir. and then has his followers, or the, his followers then follows that individual for several blocks, and, that, and the elected official, Bill Perkins, Councilman Perkins, sir. feels threatened? I'm glad that they gave you the right questions. We never did that. That is why District Attorney Morgenthau could not indict me. That is why no warrant was issued. That is why in all of the clips that were played initially, Councilman Perkins called for my arrest. But you see me in none of the clips. 
I didn't tell anyone, go get him, go do this. And all of those who are around Did him, all of them, Americans? all of them, just a second, all of them who are around him are his own supporters, and they are the ones jostling him and moving him. Not one of the brothers or sisters, the youth that I watched from across the street, ever touched him, not one of them ever threatened him, but in the tradition of Harlem, as we always have done in Harlem, they did ask him why this and why that and how come you this and how come you that. I think it was a good exchange. There is no need for the councilman to fear any violence or physical harm from us, but we are going to send the councilman home come election time so he can watch the activities of Harlem from the television set comfortably at home. What do you say to those that say you are nothing more than a con man? I would say that I am gaining by the grace of God the confidence of my people that they see me as not one who will turn heels on them and run or grab the money as the lie goes out when we played video film after video clip in court and there is no evidence to support that. I think that I have gained to a great degree their confidence and we were in the what is called the Latino community and they shouted in the streets chanting when we went through and when we stopped to greet them. I have gained the confidence of our people and God is increasing that confidence on a daily and consistent basis. But if by that you mean something negative, I have never been that. And it's not in me to be that, sir. Minister Khalid Muhammad, thank you very much for joining us on New York One. Thank you. I hope you get that bonus.